It is uh, really good to be here. I was here a couple years ago and love this church, love its staff, um, I'm many friends here, and so always a pleasure to be here. But we will be in Luke uh, chapter 9 uh, today, if your Bibles are out and keep them open as we walk through it. Uh, it is Holy Week, and I picked a passage that's not in Holy Week. It is well before, actually, Palm Sunday in Jesus' life, well before he's back in Jerusalem, well before, of course, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, but it's a passage um, that has really struck me this week as I think about it, where Jesus mentions the cross well before he ever goes to the cross. And I do think it would lead to a good amount of confusion. Actually, in Luke chapter 9, it says that the disciples were very confused as Jesus talked about his death twice and the cross once. But as you're reading through this, as we read it together, we have to keep in mind that Jesus has his death in mind as he's talking to his disciples and he uses the cross that is to come to talk about the way of the Christian life. And so that's where I want to go uh, today to look at this illustration that he uses as Jesus talks with his own death in mind. So this is Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 23. And Jesus said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Amen. And the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God will stand forever. Let me pray and ask for God's help. Uh, Jesus, these are your words. And Lord, um, you call us to take up our cross daily. And not very long from when you spoke these words, you went to your own cross, the ultimate cross. Uh, Jesus, help us in this week as we sort of journey with you in remembrance um, to the cross and to see your love poured out for your people and help us to see what that means for us even today. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, every Holy Week I think of my dad growing up, um, that my dad was a, uh, a guy, he's a bulletproof dad. Uh, he never seemed to waver in decisions. He never seemed to worry. He never seemed, um, he, he just never seemed to get overwhelmed. And I tell this story most years uh, during this time, um, that later on in my life, when I became a father for the second time, when I was years in the pastoral ministry, um, when, um, when life became overwhelming to me, I didn't really know what to do with those feelings. I was uh, anxious, stressed about work, anxious, stressed about my kids, about money, about future, about everything. I was having problems sleeping at night. Uh, I was having problems even really expressing what it was. I didn't want to put that on my wife, put that on my kids, put that on my friends. And so I did one of the wisest things I had done. I had called my father, and I asked him, Dad, this is what I'm going through. And at one point in the conversation, I asked, did you ever go through something like this too? And I knew the answer was going to be no, right? Uh, no, Joe. I just always knew what I was doing. Just, you know, deal with it. And there was a long pause on the phone, and he said, Joe, I felt like that for 40 years. Um, he was an accountant. He hated being an accountant. Uh, he worked for one company his whole career, got transferred around a ton. He was an auditor, so he was always a bad news guy. No one was happy to see the auditor come into the plant that week. Uh, he was worried about what he was going to do next year for work if he had to leave this job. He was worried about the economy. He was worried about his kids. He was worried about everything. And there were sleepless nights, and there was nights he didn't know who to talk to. Um, and he said, Joe, I've been through that. And then he gave me some good advice on how to deal with that kind of stuff. But I'll always remember that conversation because I always knew my dad loved me. I never understood the depth of his love for me until that moment because what I remember about my dad is he would come home from work and he'd want to throw the ball with me in the backyard. Uh, he'd want to make sure I mowed the yard right up to his standards. He'd want to make sure I did homework. Um, he never talked about work. I didn't even know what my dad did uh, for half of his career because I never thought to ask him about it. He never brought it up. But with all of that going on behind the scenes, when I saw that and saw how he loved us anyways, I actually saw how he was willing to suffer for his family. 
and how he was willing to suffer showed me the depth of love he had for me. I understood my father's love better that day because of what he was willing to go through for us. Um, when we look at the cross, we see the depth of Jesus' love for his people. When we look at his suffering, we see the depth, what he was willing to go to for his bride. Uh, but not just that. When my dad said those things about his suffering, I felt a connection with him. That I felt not alone. That I felt like he understood it to a degree that I didn't. And to an infinite degree, Jesus understands our suffering, our pain, our tragedies to a degree that we will never understand because he went through them himself. Uh, John Stott famously said, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. Uh, making sense of tragedy and sin, guilt. Uh, the cross shows us what kind of God we have. And Jesus takes that illustration of what kind of God we have, and he actually says, this is not just who God is, the cross. But the cross also is the way we are to live as his people. And so, what I want us to see today is to follow Jesus is to know his cross. And in a very unique way, to live the cross. To follow Jesus is to know his cross, and in a very unique way, to live that cross. So, what do we learn about the cross in this passage? Jesus talking about it well before he goes to it. We learn three things. We learn the denial of the cross, the shame of the cross, and the glory of the cross. The denial, the shame, the glory. The first, the denial of the cross. I have to set a little bit of context here because I just kind of plopped us into Luke 9. Uh, what exactly is going on? Jesus has done a lot in this passage, in this chapter. He's fed 5,000 people. Uh, he has had this uh, kind of strange interaction with Peter, where Peter is telling him what other people are saying about Jesus, and Jesus asks him, well, who do you say I am? And he confesses him to be the Christ, the Messiah. Then Jesus tells him not to tell anyone about that. And then Jesus immediately moves into, you're right, and I'm going to die. I'm going to be given up. I'm going to suffer. He actually says that twice in this passage about his death. And then Jesus flies into this passage where he brings up the cross and he tells them to deny themselves. Now, again, I, I kind of want to, I, I, I can't get into the mind of Christ as a finite man, but just the fact that he mentions the cross, I think would be pretty jarring to everyone around them. I mean, who mentioned the cross? We weren't talking about a cross. Uh, on this side of the cross, they didn't really know what was going to come. They, that wasn't the symbol of Christianity, Right? that Jesus mentions this cross, it would be like mentioning the execution chair all of a sudden, some graphic depiction of suffering. And Jesus mentions the cross, probably leaving the disciples very confused, but you have to wonder, that's on Jesus' mind. It's getting closer and closer and closer, and he's helping his disciples maybe not understand it in this moment fully, but for them to understand it when they see what's coming. And the first aspect of the cross that he brings up is to deny yourself. Deny yourself and take up your cross. That part of the Christian life is, is setting aside us as the center of the universe to deny ourselves pleasure, to deny ourselves glory for the glory of the king. And he clarifies that statement with two other statements that comes that, that may be a little confusing, but it really is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. The first thing that he says that if you work to save your life, you will lose it. And if you lose for your life for my sake, you will save it. These are one of these sort of sayings that Jesus gives about this upside-down kingdom, this upside-down life as a Christian. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. The way up is down. The way of Christian maturity is weakness and dependency upon another, upon the king. And then Jesus tells us again, secondly, that there is a way to live your life not in the upside-down kingdom. There's a way to live your life that, that doesn't have suffering or self-denial, but you can gain the whole world and still lose yourself. And so what is Jesus getting at? He's getting at the way of the Christian life. The way of Jesus looks like losing ourselves in him. But self-denial looks like placing Jesus at the center of the universe and not ourselves. It looks like living for his glory and not our own. Living for his name and not our own. That true freedom actually looks like denying things, denying a way of life that we so desire, but we weren't designed for to give all of ourselves to Jesus, even in sacrifice, even in death, every part of us. Because Jesus is not interested in many parts of his people. He's interested in all of his people, all of their hearts, all of their lives. And it sounds like too much, doesn't it? Like when we read this passage... 
If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. What I want Jesus to say here is if anyone wants to follow me, give up 10% of your money and come on. What I want him to say is give up a couple hours of your week and come on. What I want him to say is lay down a few things in your life and pick up a new patterns and, and follow me. But he doesn't say that. He demands all of us. But here's what we'll see. That Jesus never asks for anything that he hasn't already done for us. But again, I think this statement is preparing his disciples for what is to come. The second person of the Trinity will go to the cross denying himself. Actually, him already wearing flesh here and being man is denying himself. He leaves glory to come into this world. But on the cross, he denies himself the power that he has to come down from that cross, to not stay put there, to not suffer and die vulnerably, but he stays there denying himself. Why? A love for his people. But the act of self-denying for the Christian is not simply sort of harming ourselves to love Jesus more, to suffer for Jesus, and then we'll understand him. It's actually the way of freedom. It was the way that we were meant to live. It is to put Christ at the very center of our lives that we were made for, to worship him, to find our all in him, to lose myself in him. Why? Because he's infinitely worthy of it. That I was designed to stand in awe of him with all of who I am. But we can only do that when we do find Jesus infinitely worthy. I don't think the disciples were there quite yet. Uh, They won't self-deny. They won't deny themselves when he goes to the cross. They'll hide. But they will begin to see more and more that he is worthy of their lives and actually all of them giving their lives for Jesus. When we find him worthy, we will find self-denial, actually freedom. Uh, It's one of my favorite illustrations. But um, I love the suffering a young college student, a young male college student will go through when he gets engaged. Uh, That a guy will wake up one day and realize he's dating the girl he wants to marry. And that he needs to put a ring on that finger before she wises up and leaves him. And so what does he do? He could be the laziest college guy in the universe. But he'll start getting his act together. He'll go get a job. He'll save money for the very first time in his life. He'll save all this money denying social stuff and, and freedom and, and kind of working to collect all this money. And then he'll take all this money to a jewelry store, which he's never been before in his life. He'll buy this ring that he doesn't appreciate, doesn't really know why it's a thing. He'll go have a conversation with her scary father, and that's a lot of sacrifice to do that conversation. He'll go before her. He'll orchestrate an illustration, or, um, a, a, an engagement. He'll get on a knee, a vulnerable position. He'll give that ring away with no financial investment on that return, return on that investment whatsoever. And he does all of that with a smile on his face. That's a lot of suffering. That's a lot of denying self, isn't it? But why does he do it? He does it with a smile on his face because that's what you do when you find something of infinite value. You're willing to give up everything to get it. That's not sacrifice to him. It doesn't even feel like self-denial. All he's focusing on is the bride that he'll spend the rest of his life with. What does it look like to take up our cross? It really does look like suffering. It really does look like pain. It really will make us uncomfortable. If our eyes are on Jesus, it will not feel like self-denial at all. It will feel like worship. It will feel like freedom, the life that we were made for. He talks about self-denial, the denial of the cross. But then second, and maybe a little more uncomfortably, Jesus talks about the shame of the cross. Uh, This is verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in glory, the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Uh, Now this really is a warning. Jesus said, don't be ashamed of me. Don't leave me. Don't doubt me. Don't put me a fourth or fifth or sixth importance of your life. Don't be embarrassed to carry this cross. Don't hide me as a part of your life. It is a warning. But at the same time, as every warning is in Scripture, it's also a promise, isn't it? That Jesus calls his disciples to not be ashamed. And he's still still 75 miles away from Jerusalem. Weeks, maybe months, maybe a year away from the cross. And we have to imagine it's the cross that's in his head And that he knows what's coming. He knows they will be ashamed of him. That Peter will deny him three times. Jesus calls, he tells Peter it's going to happen and Peter still doesn't. 
that his disciples will run and hide from him, that no one will come to defend him. But does he know what he's going to hear as he's dying on the cross? Does he know in a mocking tone he will hear, Hail, King of the Jews. You would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross. He saved others. He can't save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, and then we'll believe him. Let's see if Elijah will save him. Does he have in mind what he's going to experience? That he'll be dressed in purple clothing, mocking kingship, purple, a sign of royalty, of importance. They'll dress him in that, and they'll beat him to a pulp. Does he know that he'll wear a crown of thorns? Does he have that in his mind, that he'll be spat on, that he'll be mockingly kneeled to paying homage, that he'll be naked on a cross, suffocating, drinking sour wine from a sponge as he dies? And we know what he'll ultimately experience, that he'll cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father will turn his face away. Jesus has become sin and shame itself. And to think about that all together, all of a sudden, this idea of Jesus saying, don't be ashamed of me, takes on all new meaning, doesn't it? Don't be ashamed of me. I'm not ashamed of you. And I see Jesus knows his people. He knows everything about his people. He knows their sin and shame, what they thought, what they've said, what they've done, everything about them. He still goes to the cross to go through all of that for his people. Don't be ashamed of me. You will see. How not ashamed of you I am as your king. Have you ever been in a moment where you expected shame and you received love? I think it's one of the most uh, greatest emotional experiences you can go through, right? Um, I love those stories of a person, a loved one going through cancer treatment and, and the, loses their hair in the treatment and shaves their head. And the stories of, of classrooms of children shaving their head because of their classmate. Family shaving their head because of their mother. Fam- or, uh, friends doing that so that that person's not alone. And I'll watch those news stories videos in my office and just kind of weep because it's such a powerful moment of something that they thought was going to be a source of shame and embarrassment and ridicule. Uh, maybe that people will kind of grimace when they look at them and, and think it looks strange and be uncomfortable around them. All of a sudden they're met with a group of people who love them so deeply that they join them in that shame. I should take it on themselves. Jesus, the shame of the cross is that he becomes his people's shame in order to free them from that life and make them his, his holy and loved people. Do we see that the shame of the cross is the end of our shame, the end of our sin, the end of our guilt? And that Jesus says, don't be ashamed of me. I'll never fail you. I'll never leave you. Look at what's coming. He's preparing us to look at the cross. He's preparing us for the life of the cross, to look back at it. But then lastly, he points to us to the glory of the cross. Now this is verse 27, which more ink has been spilled on this verse than I would care to mention. But verse 27, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. The theories that abound on this verse are amazing. What is he talking about? That some will be here when Jesus comes back for his second coming. And there's actually theories out there that John, the apostle, still alive because he's never recorded his death in the Bible, that he's waiting around for the second coming. I don't know if that's true. I don't think that's true. Uh, some people think this is about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Some people think this is about the resurrection or the cross itself. We don't really know. All of those might have a piece of what Jesus is talking about, but we do know. But in Luke and in Mark, in this passage that Jesus says, take up your cross, what's immediately followed is the transfiguration. The transfiguration where Jesus takes his inner three disciples, Peter, James, and John, to a mountain, and then all of a sudden it says, Jesus is transfigured. We don't know what that looks like. We know they beheld his glory in a unique way that they had not seen before because of their reaction. We know that when Jesus was transfigured, he was having a casual conversation with Moses and Elijah talking about the exodus, Moses' exodus, but also Jesus' deliverance of his people that's coming. And in that moment, the disciples had never seen Jesus like this, and you have to wonder, since it's bracketed by two comments on Jesus' death, it might be a moment where Jesus thought they need to see something. They need to see behind the curtain here. 
But in some sense, Jesus needs to sort of flex his divinity to show them who he really is, that they're really in the presence of the king. How do they see the kingdom of God in this moment? They see the king of the kingdom right there before him in his glory. And I wonder about this. I've been thinking about this all morning. I wonder, as they saw Jesus transfigured in his glory, did one of them think, surely this guy's not going to die? Who would kill him? He's God. And on the flip side of that, I wonder, as they saw him beaten and put on the cross, if that picture of the transfiguration came into their mind. He's made himself weak. He doesn't have to be there. The glory of the cross is the king went to die for his people. The glory of the cross is that's not, that's just this a uh, guy. That's the second person of the Trinity. That is the one that will stand in amazement of for all of eternity and never cease to be amazed by him. That is the one whom will welcome us into the new heavens and new earth and we'll see him and he'll have his resurrected body and what will be on his resurrected body but scars on his hand and his feet and his side. And they will be beautiful. The glory of the cross, it was Jesus who went there himself. Do we see it? Do we marvel at the cross? And do we see that as we pick up our cross that there's glory on the other side? It's not glory of our situations being better or our circumstances or our life being better, but it's the glory to come where we will dwell with him forever and eternity. The cross is at the very center of Christianity. The cross is at the very center of the Christian life. The king worth denying ourselves for. That we will infinitely find more and more glorious as we know him. Take up your cross and deny yourself takes on all new meaning. Because the disciples heard this. They did not understand it. But when they saw the crucifixion, when they saw the resurrection, all of a sudden it became in focus. They were with the king the whole time who took his people's place. Do we see the glory of the cross? Do we see that the Christian life is a life of denial, but it's freedom of Christ, the life that is not shame, but shame taken away from us, a life of glory, not ours, but his, a life lived in the glory of the king. Let me pray. Father in heaven, how often do we make the Christian life a, a sort of a crossless life? as if, Jesus, you didn't accomplish anything. And Lord, how often is it that we see our suffering and we don't know what to do about it? It's painful and it's hard. And Lord, help us cast our eyes upon you. That in the darkest moment of human history came the greatest news the world has ever heard. Jesus, this week, and really every week, help us meditate on the cross, looking forward to the resurrection to see your accomplished work for your people that gives us rest. In Jesus' name, amen.